Nightline begins now with me, Liana Hassanel. The headlines. Handover of first littoral combat ship still within same timeline, says Defence Minister. And Datuk Sri Najib given two days MC, one MDB trial vacated. Good morning. The government will continue to be committed to ensuring that its policies prioritise the need to preserve the wealth of the nation's biodiversity. Prime Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob said the government was also committed to ensuring that the pace of the country's development is environmentally friendly for the benefit of future generations. Citing the impact of participation in Expo 2020 Dubai as an example, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri said it would contribute to economic recovery and the development of the country in the future through trade cooperation including the introduction of green smart homes, the use of artificial intelligence in agriculture, clean energy, and several other future solutions. He added that high dedication and close cooperation through a whole-of-government approach has made the Malaysian Pavilion an effective platform for sharing ideas and successfully highlighted the country's potential to lead the global sustainability agenda. He also said that the Malaysian Pavilion is a symbol of success of the Malaysian family when, it values are tr when its values are translated into a strong plan of action and a unified attitude in achieving harmony, progress, sustainability and stability. The Prime Minister said this at the Malaysian Pavilion Dubai Expo 2020 Appreciation Ceremony in Kuala Lumpur on Wednesday night. The handover of the first littoral combat ship LCS to the Royal Malaysian Navy RMN is still within the timeline as announced earlier. Senior Defence Minister Datuk Sri Hishamuddin Tun Hussein said, firstly, this was to assure the people that the LCS project must go on. And secondly, the government will not protect anybody who is guilty if there is abuse and misappropriation. He was commenting on local media reports on the delay in the date of delivery for LCS in a special interview with Malaysian Armed Forces MAF Chief General Tan Sri Effendi Buang on Tuesday. In August, the Defence Ministry was given six months to mobilise efforts to revive the project and he believed the first ship will be received by RMN in two years. Meanwhile, Datuk Sri Hishamuddin said his ministry is prepared for the flood disaster expected to hit the country in November. He said his ministry and the MAF are also in the flood committee, chaired by the Prime Minister, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob. The MAF has beefed up its preparedness and ready to deploy its personnel and assets in case of floods. Prior to this, the Malaysian Meteorological Department issued a forecast that the country would experience continuous heavy rain from mid-November, which could bring floods at the end of the month. On another note, Datuk Sri Hishamuddin said the application to increase the defence budget for 2023 to 1.5% of gross domestic product GDP will facilitate planning for asset acquisition. He, however, said it depends entirely on the state of the country's economy and discussions with the finance ministry and agencies responsible for looking at the total amount available for national development. Ratusan yang dikaitkan dengan um, GDP ini merupakan sesuatu yang boleh memudahkan kita merancang untuk 10, 20, 30, 50 tahun yang akan datang. Dan dasar pertahanan negara Dasar yang sedia ada dalam TUDM, TLDM, TDM um, tidak berkisar kepada peruntukan tahunan sahaja um, jauh ke, uh, lihat ke hadapan. Tetapi sama ada ia dapat dijayakan atau tidak banyak bergantung kepada peruntukan yang disalurkan kepada kita. Datuk Sri Hishamuddin said this in a press conference after visiting Sekolah Kebangsaan Kementah and the Rumah Keluarga Malaysia Angkatan Tentera in Desa Tun Hussein On in Kuala Lumpur on Wednesday. He also hoped that the defence industry policy, which will be launched soon, could prove that the ministry is capable of bringing returns to the national economy, in addition to maintaining the stability, security and sovereignty of the country. The senior minister also revealed that a total of 8 million ringgit has been allocated for the immediate maintenance of school facilities in Malaysian Armed Forces camps nationwide. The allocation, he said, would benefit more than 20,000 students, as well as over 2,000 teachers and support staff. 
Datuk Seri Mohamad Najib Tun Razak's corruption trial involving One Malaysia Development Berhad, One MDB Funds, has been vacated for the rest of the week as he is currently warded in Kuala Lumpur Hospital, HKL. His lead counsel, Tan Sri Muhammad Shafi Abdullah, told the Kuala Lumpur High Court that the former Prime Minister has been issued a two-day medical certificate beginning Wednesday by the prison's department. Tan Sri Muhammad Shafi informed Judge Datuk Colin Lawrence Sekira on Wednesday that his client was still undergoing medical treatment and tests since he was hospitalized on Tuesday due to his blood pressure and stomach ulcer condition. The lawyer said Datuk Sri Najib's blood pressure is coming down after taking his accustomed medicine, although it was not as satisfactory to his usual blood pressure. The judge then vacated this week's trial and fixed September 26 to resume the hearing. Meanwhile, when met by reporters after the proceeding, Tan Sri Muhammad Shafi said so far there was no indication if Datuk Sri Najib would be transferred to the National Heart Institute, IJN. The Pekan Member of Parliament is facing four charges of using his position to obtain bribes, totaling 2.3 billion ringgit from 1MDB funds, and 21 charges of money laundering involving the same amount. Judges in all circumstances must be faithful to the federal constitution and be resolute in upholding the rule of law. Chief Justice Tun Tengku Maimun Tuan Mat said this in her speech at the reference proceedings held on Wednesday to honour the memory of former Lord President, the late Tun Dr. Mohamed Saleh Abbas. Tun Tengku Maimun said the year 1988 would always be remembered as the darkest chapter in the history of the Malaysian judiciary, as its independence, vouchsafed by the federal constitution, was stunned by the removal of Tun Dr. Saleh as Lord President. She added that it infamously led to the upheaval of the nation's judicial system and a shattering blow to the judiciary and the constitution. According to her, Tun Dr. Saleh had said that judges ought to observe and respect the concept of separation of powers for judges should not enroach into the domain of the executive or the legislative branches of the government. Tun Dr. Saleh had acknowledged that it is the role of the judiciary to invalidate any acts of the executive or the legislative using prerogative writs or declarations, should they transgress their powers beyond the limits granted to them by the federal constitution. During Tun Dr. Saleh's tenure as Lord President, the Malaysian judiciary was hailed as a model for other countries in terms of the independence of credibility of the judiciary. Malaysia is unlikely to get into a recession due to its diversified structure of economy, which is less dependent on commodities. Bursa Malaysia Chairman Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Omar said the agriculture and mining sectors only contribute 14% to the country's GDP, while the services and manufacturing sectors contribute 57 and 24% respectively. And we have also uh, um, diversified our markets where um, our exports, uh, for example, uh, they're not really dependent on any particular country as well. And plus, we also have a very well-functioning financial system. Uh, the banks are very well capitalized, they are well managed, they are very effectively uh, regulated uh, and supervised by the central bank. He added that local banks and financial services companies have significant weighting in both the FBM KLCI and the FTSE for good, Bursa Malaysia Sustainability Index. Seven banking stocks alone, Maybank, Public Bank, CIMB, Hong Leong, RHB, Ambank and Alliance Bank have a combined market capitalization of more than 325 billion ringgit. This is about 20% of the total market capitalization of 1.65 trillion ringgit as of June. Join me with Central Spectrum Cindy Ryan Berhat this Saturday at 5 p.m. only on TV Tiga. Yang di Pertuan Agong Al Sultan Abdullah Ri Ayatuddin Al Mustafa Bila Shah and Raja Permaisuri Agong Tunku Haja Aziza Amina Maimuna Iskandaria will represent Malaysia at the state funeral ceremony of Queen Elizabeth II on Monday. The matter was confirmed by Foreign Minister Datuk Sri Saifuddin Abdullah on Wednesday. 
Queen Elizabeth, Britain's longest reigning monarch, died at the age of 96 at Balmoral Castle in Scotland on September 8. According to media reports, the body of Queen Elizabeth is now in London and will be placed in Buckingham Palace until the state funeral ceremony at Westminster Abbey on September 19. Her body will be buried next to the grave of her husband, the late Prince Philip. Queen Elizabeth was the second longest reigning monarch in European history after King Louis V of France. In the meantime, the Queen's coffin has arrived at the Palace of Westminster on Wednesday after a somber procession from Buckingham Palace. The procession saw the Queen's coffin leave the palace at 2.22 p.m. local time. The grand procession through the flag-lined heart of London represented the latest spectacular step in the 11 days of intricately choreographed national mourning. Across the United Kingdom, that will culminate with the funeral on Monday of its longest reigning monarch. The procession, which had led by King Charles III, arrived at Westminster Hall shortly after 3 p.m., with Princess William and Harry were also in attendance. The coffin will now be placed on the cat cataphlag with a short service held by the Archbishop of Canterbury to follow. After a service lasting around 20 minutes, the Queen's lying in state will begin, lasting for four days and ending on the morning of the state funeral on September 19th. The Sungai Besi Ulu Klang Elevated Expressway Suka is set to ease traffic congestion in the eastern part of Kuala Lumpur by 30%. According to the highway operator, the first phase of the highway, involving a 16.6-kilometer stretch from the Churas Kajang Interchange to Bukit Antarabangsa, would be opened to the public very soon. Project Lintasan Kota Holdings Sindran Berhad, Pro Lintas Group Executive Officer Datuk Muhammad Azlan Abdullah, said as the stretch had been completed, its opening has been approved by the government for the benefit of road users. Speaking at a media briefing on the project in Kuala Lumpur on Wednesday, he added that upon its opening, Suka, which spans 24.4 kilometers from Sri Putaling to Jalan Hulu Klang, is expected to see around 80,000 vehicles traveling on the highway daily. Apabila ianya siap dibuka, kami harap ia dapat me mengurangkan kesesakan uh, uh, trafik terutamanya di uh, jalan lingkaran tengah 2 ataupun lebih dikenali sebagai MRR2, uh, Middle Ring Road 2 uh, dan juga dari Lok U, Pusat Bandar uh, dan juga di Jalan Ampang. Uh, secara amnya kita sasarkan penjimatan sebanyak 30% uh, peratus kesesakan di laluan sedia ada. Jadi lebuh raya Sungai Besi Ulu Kelang ini uh, lebih kepada memberikan option ataupun alternatif kepada para pengguna lebuh raya untuk menggunakan laluan uh, Sungai Besi Ulu Kelang ini sebagai satu alternatif yang lebih cepat, lebih convenient, lebih selamat dan lebih efisien kepada uh, pengguna uh, uh, jalan raya. He also said Suka would offer its users connectivity to several existing expressways, such as the Duta Ulu Klang Expressway, Duke, and Ampang Kuala Lumpur Elevated Highway, Akle. Senior Works Minister Datuk Sri Fadila Yusuf was scheduled to announce the date of the opening of the first phase of the highway on Thursday. Five individuals were detained, suspected of being involved in using Android Package Kit. APK file applications to scam victims of money from their bank accounts. Royal Malaysia Police PDRM Secretary Datuk Norsia Muhammad Sadudin said three men and two women aged 17 to 21 were picked up around the federal capital in raids conducted on August 24th. In a statement issued on Wednesday, Datuk Norsia said investigations found all of them were operating under false accounts of a popular chatting site. Elaborating further, she said victims who wanted to know them better would later be offered to see their pictures or videos through another application, which would be sent via APK file. Apart from that, the victims would be required to buy a token before being allowed to access the application. From this, it would allow the scammers to withdraw the money from the victims' accounts. Members of the public were advised to be careful and avoid downloading APK files sent directly to the smartphone by unknown individuals. She stressed that the security system of short message service on the phone should be protected as it receives the one-time password OTP from various applications on the smartphone. 
The probe was conducted under the penal code, and the link between the syndicate with other cheating cases is under ongoing investigation. Thai military facility shooting leaves two dead. This and more right after this breather. The foreign news. In Thailand, a gunman has killed two people and wounded one other in a shooting at a military facility in Bangkok on Wednesday. Officials said a suspect had been detained after the incident, which occurred at 8.45 a.m. local time at the Army Training Command in the capital central Dusit district. It was reported that the suspect is a soldier who allegedly entered the building carrying a firearm and shot at personnel on duty, killing two. The suspect then fled after the attack but was soon arrested in front of the military unit. Police said the suspect's mental health is being assessed as part of the probe adding that the cause and motivation for the incident is under investigation. Over in the West Bank, Israeli troops shot dead two Palestinian gunmen on Wednesday in a clash near the boundary with the occupied land in which an army officer was also killed. According to a military spokesman, troops intercepted two men spotted approaching an Israeli barrier along the West Bank boundary near the town of Jenin. He added that the men opened fire, killing an army officer and were shot dead by the other troops. The Jinnan Brigade claimed the two dead gunmen as its members and confirmed the kill of the army officer. The West Bank, among territories where Palestinians seek statehood, has seen a surge of violence in recent months as Israel has intensified raids following a spate of lethal Palestinian street attacks in its cities. Thailand's Constitutional Court on Wednesday set September 30th, 30th as the date to deliver its verdict on the tenure of Prime Minister Prayuth chan o -cha, a case that seeks to determine whether he has already exceeded an eight-year limit as Premier. The court must decide whether the eight years should include Prayuth's time as leader of the military administration he installed after toppling the Pua Thai government. Prayuth has given no opinion on the case and said he will respect the outcome. A government spokesperson said in a statement that the verdict would be a chance for clarity and urges the public to wait and see and respect the results. Meanwhile, Prayuth, who seized power in a 2014 coup before formally becoming Prime Minister soon after, is suspended while the court deliberates on the case filed by the opposition Pua Thai Party which argues he should have left office last month. The national under-19 team began their under-20 Asian Cup qualifying campaign with a 1-1 draw with hosts Mongolia and Ulaanbaatar on Wednesday. The Group E tie got off to an intense start as both teams threw caution to the wind in search of goals. Unfortunately for Malaysia, a foul on Buyanamak Ganbad in the penalty box led to the referee pointing to the spot and the youngster picked himself up to coolly slot home in the 24th minute. The Harima Muda squad, however, refused to lie down and redoubled their efforts in search of the equaliser, which duly came nine minutes after the restart, when Alif Izwan Yuslan slotted home a pass from Najmudin Akmal. Malaysia, who are coached by Hassan Sazali Waras, will take on Sri Lanka on Friday, September 16th, for the crucial tie against South Korea on Sunday. Only the top 10 group winners and five best runners-up will advance to the Asian Cup Finals in Uzbekistan next March. 
Alex Albin has been released from hospital after he suffered respiratory failure and was left on a ventilator following complications from surgery. Albin, 26, was ruled out of the Italian Grand Prix in Monza with appendicitis on Saturday morning before being transferred to nearby San Gerardo Hospital for treatment. The Williams driver underwent surgery but then ended up in intensive care and required assistance with breathing. But Albin was removed from mechanical ventilation on Sunday before being given the green light to leave hospital and travel back to his home in Monaco on Tuesday. Albin will be hopeful of returning to his Williams cockpit for the next round in Singapore on October 2nd. After this breather, police begins their investigation of cosmetic sales agent kidnapping. Welcome back. In Johor, a, police, a policeman was among two men killed in a six-vehicle accident on the North-South Expressway near Pago on Wednesday. Two other people were also injured in the 4.45 a.m. incident involving three lorries, a bus, a trailer and a Protonwira car. Pago Fire and Rescue Station Chief Assistant Fire Superintendent Mohamed Fadli Ismail said upon receiving an emergency call, a team of 16 firemen assisted by emergency medical rescue services personnel from Bukit Gambir Fire Station were dispatched to the location. The firefighters then extricated two victims who were pinned in one of the lorries and the car. Moor Police Chief ACP Ra'is Muklis Azman Aziz said both victims who died at the scene were identified as lorry driver, 45-year-old K. Gunalan, and 55-year-old cop Sinawi Jelani, attached to the Kuala Lumpur Contingent Police Headquarters. The two injured victims were provided treatment by medical personnel, while the bodies of the deceased were handed over to the police for further action. The cause of the accident is being investigated under the Road Transport Act. In Klantan, a 36-year-old woman has been reported missing since Tuesday in Kampung Semat Jal, Tumpat, and is believed to have been kidnapped and taken to a neighboring country. District Police Chief ACP Amrandola said in the 5.10 p.m. incident, the victim was believed to have been kidnapped by four men using a brown-colored Toyota Vios vehicle. In a statement on Wednesday, Amran confirmed that police have received a report on the incident and the case was still under investigation. He added that the suspects were believed to be armed with pistols and the car was seen being driven towards Wakaf Baru. He also urged those with information to immediately call the Klantan Contingent Police Headquarters or Tumpat Police Headquarters Operations Room. The public were also advised not to make any speculation on the case that can jeopardize the probe. Earlier, the victim's father lodged a police report at the Palikbang police station claiming his daughter, a cosmetics sales agent, was abducted. Closed-circuit television camera recordings from their home showed at least four armed men wearing face masks and caps bundling the woman into the Vios car. Sources said that the abducted's car was later found abandoned near the border in Pankalan, Kubor. The case was being investigated under the penal code for kidnapping. In Negri Sambilan, a man who caused a five-car accident on the North-South Expressway last June while driving under the influence of drugs was fined 6,000 ringgit by the Rimbao Magistrates Court on Wednesday. 28-year-old Munzir Azmir Abdul Rahim was given the punishment by Magistrate Kartini Kasran after he pleaded guilty to two counts of possession and consumption of drugs. The court also ordered him to serve imprisonment for 10 months and eight eight months respectively for each of the charge if he failed to pay the fine. On the first charge, the accused was found in possession of dried plants believed to be cannabis, weighing 2.49 grams in his Bordeaux Myvi car on the highway in Rimbao on June 5th. He was also charged with consuming cannabis at the narcotics division of the Rimbao police headquarters on the same day. Aside from the penalty, Munzir was also ordered to undergo monitoring by the National Anti-Drugs Agency for a period of two years. In Tranganu, a care centre assistant was remanded for four days until Saturday by the Kuala Tranganu Magistrate's Court for allegedly abusing a five-year-old dis disabled boy. The remand order on the 34-year-old woman was issued by Magistrate Nurmazrini Mahmud to facilitate police investigation into the case. 
Kuala Terengganu Police Chief ACP Abdul Rahim Mat Din, who confirmed the matter, said the suspect was picked up at her home at 4.30 p.m. on Tuesday. This after the staff at the care centre lodged a police report following an internal investigation which uncovered the abuses through closed-circuit television CCTV recordings at the premises. It was believed that the abuse, abuses occurred since July until August this year. The victim was currently being treated at the Sultana Nur Zahira Hospital in Kuala Terengganu. The case was being probed under the Child Act. Over in the United Kingdom, a cast of Ukrainian dancers rehearsed a new production of Giselle, directed by Russian director Alexei Ratsmansky at the London Coliseum Theatre on Monday. The performers are part of the United Ukrainian Ballet, a company of 60 refugee Ukrainian dancers, technicians and creatives who fled their home country after Moscow launched its invasion in February. Let's take a look at the dramatic story about love, death and forgiveness as we wrap up Nightline this time around. And with that, I'm Lena Hassanel. Thank you for watching and stay safe, Malaysia.